There are many different ways to craft memorable gaming experiences. Some companies grew gigantic by focusing on competitive multiplayer. Some focus on crafting cinematic experiences. Others build gigantic exciting worlds to roleplay in. Some companies found an audience because their games allow for creative expression, like no others. And some, well, some just produce digital crack. But Nintendo, well, Nintendo never really cared too much about most of those things. Instead, Nintendo is famous for always putting play first, for being more concerned with the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay than any other big player in the industry. And it is this approach that allowed them to craft revolutionary gaming experiences over and over and over again until very recently. But recently, I played through Nintendo's newest Mario adventure, Bowser's Fury. And while I overall really enjoyed my time with the game, it also kind of opened my eyes for a problem that many recent Nintendo games have. Many of Nintendo's recent titles are so obsessively putting gameplay over everything else that it actually starts to make their games worse. So today, we're going to take a deep dive into this problem. We're going to take a look at how Nintendo crafted many brilliant games in the past using their gameplay first approach. We will chat about how gameplay is only one of the many parts required to create a great game. And we will discuss how Nintendo brutally neglected important parts of Bowser's theory because of their unhealthy obsession with gameplay. So are you ready? Let's do this. Super Mario 3D World is a remarkable game for many different reasons. The game burns through more ideas in an hour than most games do over their entire playtime. It features one of the most fun multiplayer modes I've ever played in any game. The whole thing goes on for much longer than one would expect. And most importantly, the game is simply a ton of fun from the very first stage to its second to last. The moment to moment gameplay in 3D World is just amazing. No matter what environment we jump through, what enemies we fight against, what challenges we have have to survive or how the game is trying to murder our poor plumber. It is always as pure innocent fun as a game can possibly be. So it obviously takes a lot of different things to end up with a game that is as much fun as 3D World is. But let's just focus on one really fascinating aspect of its design. One aspect that shows through what great lengths Nintendo is actually willing to go to make sure that their games are as fun as possible during every second of gameplay. Pretty much every element in 3D World serves a gameplay purpose. There is basically nothing in the game that can't be interacted with in a meaningful way. If there is a tree, then it is never just there for decoration. We can always climb it. Sometimes it is used to hide a secret. Sometimes it hides a power-up. If there are bushes, they often contain coins and can always be burned down by a fire flower, fire power, power-up, fireball. If there is a baseball lying around, we can use it to murder some of Bowser's minions. The same is true for snowballs. If there is a couch standing around in the background, then it can fly and actually leads to a secret. If there is a mirror at the wall, then it hints towards an item. If there is a rabbit, then catch Catching it is a gameplay objective. Heck, even if there is something as inconspicuous as a rock lying on the ground, then it is there to hint at a hidden block. 3D World is incredibly strict about this. If there is anything within the play area, even if it is just a rock on the ground, then this object has some use for gameplay. Nothing is just there to help to sell the atmosphere or to simply make the stage look prettier. And you know, at least in my opinion, it is great that 3D World is designed like that. The game is this fast and hectic linear platformer that often introduces several new ideas per stage. The only reason we are intuitively able to understand a lot of esoteric concepts, like that we're supposed to ground pound in the middle of a flower circle, is because the game trains us that everything we notice actually serves a purpose. But if we think this through, then this has really interesting ramifications. Because it means that every single object in the game was designed with the question, how does this serve the gameplay 
in mind. If something didn't add to the gameplay, then they did not include it. This is what I mean when I say that Nintendo always prioritizes gameplay first. They won't even put a stone texture onto the ground in 3D World if it doesn't enhance the gameplay in any meaningful way. This razor sharp focus on gameplay is a huge part of what makes 3D World such a joy to play through. And it is one of the things I personally find really exceptional about the game. But I know what at least one of you, wonderful ladies and gentlemen watching, is currently thinking. Come on, of course everything in 3D World serves a gameplay purpose. It is a linear platformer. There is no real exploration or world building or storytelling going on. It's a linear chumpy chumpy game. The whole point of the game is to chumpy chump around. It doesn't try to be anything more than chumpy chumpy fun fun and thus they only include elements that are fun to chumpy chump through. And you know, I don't necessarily disagree with you, very contrarian, rhetorical person, but that's actually not the real point here. The real point here is that Nintendo did not only design 3D World like that, actually they are designing almost all their in-house developed games like that. Take Breath of the Wild, for example. Everything there serves a purpose. Every animal that runs around can be hunted. All the trees can be cut down. Each rock can do funny things. The grass can be ignited to create an updraft and so on. Or take Super Mario Odyssey. Almost every element there is used for gameplay as well. From the rocks to the trees, from the fountains to the cactus is... E. But those are just recent examples. We can actually already see this philosophy in far older games. It is in the original Luigi's Mansion, where we can interact with pretty much any object. It is in Wind Waker, where the dungeons only contain the most necessary elements for puzzle solving. There are traces of this philosophy in A Link to the Past. It is even present in 1988's Super Mario Bros. 3. It is basically how Nintendo approaches game design in a nutshell. They search for a really fun mechanic that lends itself to amazing moment to moment gameplay and then they design their entire game around it. Every aspect, down to the point where even a couch in the background or a rock on the floor serve a gameplay purpose. And I love that they do this. There is no other big player in the industry that crafts games that are as innocent fun as Nintendo's are. Over the years they crafted many truly fuzzy full games using this approach. They got better and better at it. Each console generation, each game that they developed, they got better at reducing their games down to their absolute purest form of play. They got ridiculously good at it too good, almost obsessive. Their brilliant approach from the past slowly turned into a poison, intoxicating their franchises, leaving many other aspects of their games sickly behind to rot. So we will soon come back to what exactly it is that Nintendo is messing up in my opinion, but before that we first have to establish a bit of necessary fluff. We have to talk about a trash eating fish and we have to chat about, um, we have to have a chat about gardening. So welcome everyone to today's episode of Everything Gardening. Our topic today is the Hakuniwa Garden. Hakuniwa is a Japanese term that means literally box garden or garden in a box. It is a Japanese style of gardening that became popular in the Edo and early Meiji periods. And interestingly enough, it shares a lot of similarities with bonsai gardening. This approach to gardening focuses on creating beautiful, miniaturized landscapes in small containers, often using tiny figures, buildings, bridges and paths to create the illusion of intrinsically crafted landscapes and scenes. For those who peek into those mysterious gardens, it is often surprising to see the intricacies, the depth of layers and the realism on display within these fuzziful, tiny scenes. So what the wiggler am I waffling about? So here's the thing, everything that I just said is basically a one-to-one -one quote from an article that Bill Trinan, the senior product marketing manager of Nintendo of America, wrote back in 2018 on the Nintendo Treehouse Tumblr, out of all places. So why is Nintendo's marketing manager waffling about Japanese gardening culture on the official Nintendo Treehouse Tumblr? A sentence I'd never thought I'd have to say, by the way. Well, in order to understand this little mystery, we first have to take another tiny detour. So this here is what I'd like to call a gameplay map. It shows a gameplay scene of a game, but 
all the elements of the gameplay are only represented as single color blocks. Basically, the map shows us how the game would look like without any art assets and without particle effects and shaders and whatnot. Hooray! So here are three more of those made up gameplay maps. At first glance, all four of those maps look incredibly similar. You know, they all feature some safe ground, some ouching areas, some enemies and so on. And honestly, it isn't that surprising that they do look similar, because they're all from the exact same game. Super Mario Galaxy. But here's the thing, if we remove the maps to show the actual screenshot of the game, then we can suddenly see that they all show something completely different. The first one shows a dry desert area filled with quicksand and dead dry bones. The second one shows a hot burning volcano area featuring fire themed obstacles. The third one is actually a cookie factory that are hopefully not hungry plumber has to survive. And the last one depicts Mario jumping on top of forks stuck in a delicious but deadly dessert. If we only think in terms of gameplay, then all those challenges are incredibly similar. But they aren't, because they're coated to have a unique look and feel. And this is the thing with the Hakuniwa Gardens. See, what Trinan is talking about in his Tumblr post is that those Japanese mini gardens served as inspiration for the different worlds in Mario 64. They served as inspiration for the different kingdoms in Odyssey. And they served as inspiration for all the different planetoids in Galaxy. Those gardens are miniature copies of real places, but they are much more mysterious, much more filled with wonder than the real thing ever would be. They are like an over-romanticized, super condensed version of something real. They are a lot of fun to look at, and at least in my opinion, it makes a lot of sense to think about the environments in a Mario game in a similar way. Super Mario Galaxy took all the elements of the game that don't have anything to do with the actual moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. You know, the lightning, the particles, the music, how the enemies are presented, the textures, how the bottomless pits are framed and whatnot. And then they put a coat on top of it. They coated everything to create an over-romanticized, condensed version of something real similar to how Hakuniwa Gardens depict reality. It makes the game feel full of wonder and mystery. Galaxy's planetoids are truly fuzzyful places in my opinion. They are a joy to look at. Places like the Toy Galaxy or the Final Volcano stage are some of my absolute favorite Nintendo stages of all time. But this is not because the gameplay in those stages is the best Mario ever played or anything. It is because those stages themselves are such wonderful and amazing places. They are a ton of fun to peek into while playing for them. Similar to how it is just fun to peek into a Hakuniwa garden. So this here, this here is Clanker. Clanker is a waste deposit fish. You know, all the annoying trash that accumulates over time, it has to go somewhere. This is where good old boy Clanker comes in. He eats it. But you know, eating tons of trash isn't what scientists call a healthy diet. And thus, Clanker suffers from severe health problems. He suffers from toothache. So for anyone currently slightly confused, Clanker isn't a real world waste deposit fish or anything. Instead, Clanker is the center of a cavern stage, fittingly called Clanker's Cavern in the wonderful N64 game. Banjo and Kazooie. In Banjo and Kazooie, we blaze a bear and a bird duo on a dangerous mission to save Banjo's beautiful sister from the evil witch Grunty, who plans to steal her timeless beauty. We make our way through many different imaginative stages. We learn new, useful skills, defeat terrifying monsters, get magically transformed into animals, and we befriend many of the fascinating creatures living in Grunty's lair. One of them being Clanker. One of the objectives in the game is it to find a way to cure Clanker of his horrible toothache. So how does a bear and a bird perform dental work on a gigantic swimming waste deposit? One might ask. Well, by shooting eggs at the hurting teeth until the problem goes away. Obviously. So this here is Jinxie. Jinxie is a Chinxy is a sphinx. So for anyone not familiar, sphinx are mythical creatures with the body of a lion but the head of a bear. Chinxy is another one of the inhabitants of Grunty's lair. He lives in Gobi's Valley. And as it turns out, Chinxy suffers from a health problem as well. Chinxy suffers from a terrible cold. His nose is stuffed. Luckily, we're here to help. So how does a bird and a bear cure a sphinx from having a stuffed nose? Well, by shooting eggs at it. Obviously. 
Hooray! So why are we talking about Clanker's teeth and Jinxie's nose? Well, here's the thing. Both of those objectives are really memorable parts of Banjo and Kazooie. Everything about them is just so silly and weird that they end up being extremely memorable. And that is what I find so interesting about them. Because gameplay-wise, both of those tasks are the exact same thing. We stand on a platform and shoot X at a target. Actually, almost every stage in Benjamin and Kasui has a shoot X at a target, but it never feels as if we're performing the same task over and over again. Benjamin and Kasui is extraordinarily great at coating the different gameplay objectives to feel like completely new and unique scenarios every time. Similar to how Galaxy disguises the different environments to feel unique, Banjo disguises its gameplay objectives. The game would never task us to find and retrieve a couple of random video game elements. Instead, it tasks us with helping a whalerous captain retrieve his sunken treasure, or to save Christmas for a desperate ice bear family by tracking down their lost Christmas presents. We don't just play a simple memory game in Banjo, instead we sing along with a bunch of frogs. We don't just have to ground pound random spots Instead, we go onto an epic quest to dig up ancient pirate treasure. But most importantly, we don't just shoot eggs at targets. Instead, we cure different creatures of their health problems. The core gameplay objectives in Banjo and Kazooie are actually surprisingly simple. It is to find a bunch of things, to reach a place in time, to shoot some eggs, to defeat some enemies, and so on. The moment-to-moment -moment gameplay is often very similar, but the game goes out of its way to frame each and every objective to be a grandiose and unique task by putting an insane amount of effort into making each task feel unique. Banjo and Kazooie manages to be about much more than just its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. The shrines in Breath of the Wild are as cleanly designed as possible. Each shrine is a simple puzzle box without any unnecessary fluff added on top of it. There is nothing but the puzzles. Everything in the shrines either serves a purpose or it is incredibly understated. They are brilliantly fine-tuned to only be about the puzzle solving and the puzzle solving alone. And I personally think that the shrines are the weakest part of the incredible game that Breath of the Wild otherwise is. Meanwhile, there are those scarecrow challenges in Super Mario Odyssey. You know, the little scarecrows that are scattered all over Odyssey's wonderful kingdoms, that start a quick timer challenge that has us jump over blocks or something. Those challenges make sure that there is a quick and fun platforming challenge hidden around every corner. They're easy to spot, they don't require any annoying tutorialization to be understood, and whenever we run into one of those, we're pretty much guaranteed to have fun for the next 30 seconds of our miserable lives. Yet I think that the scarecrows in Odyssey are symptomatic for one of the game's biggest problems. So what's the deal with the shrines and the scarecrows? Well, both are the antithesis of the things we just waffled about. The shrines in Breath of the Wild don't feel like exciting places full of wonder and mystery, like the wonderful Hakoniwa-inspired planetoids in Galaxy do. Actually, they don't feel like much at all. They're just blue, soulless video game places. They aren't coated. They just confront us with a puzzle in its purest form. Breath of the Wild's shrines don't even try to feel like small replications of actual places. They want to be artificial puzzle playgrounds, and thus they end up feeling artificial. The same is true for the Scarecrow challenges. They are the opposite of how Banjo and Kazooie codes its objectives. Banjo goes out of its way to make every task feel as important and unique as possible. Odyssey, on the other hand, well, Odyssey just copy and pastes the same artificial Scarecrow over and over again. It is as if Nintendo just puts down signs that say, throw your cap if you're in the mood for a timing challenge. Those challenges often felt artificial to me while playing, and that may very well be because they are artificial. There is nothing contextualizing them. There is nothing that sets this scarecrow apart from this one or that one. And it is not just the shrines or the scarecrows that are like that. Breath of the Wild and Mario Odyssey are both filled with such examples. Odyssey's challenge rooms are often artificial gameplay rooms that don't feature any thematic coating, but are built out of colorful blocks 
floating in nothing. Breath of the Wild often repeats the exact same Korok seed puzzles, while using the exact same 20 physic objects for the entire game. Meanwhile, Odyssey does not only repeat the Scarecrow challenges, but basically every objective in the entire game. You know, we don't have to carry seeds to a pot once, but dozens of times. We don't have to dress up to get access to a unique place once, but several times. We don't have to find Princess Peach once, but in every kingdom. We don't have to spot a flying taxi once, but dozens of times. And so on. There is no objective coding. They don't even try to frame those objectives to be something different. They literally copy and paste them, the same way they copy and paste the environments of the shrines. Just that it doesn't go unmentioned. There are lovingly crafted places in Breath of the Wild that explode with charm, and there are unique and wonderful objectives in Mario Odyssey. Those areas and tasks actually end up being the highlights of the game for me, but they are the exception rather than the rule. Most of the shrines aren't designed to be exciting places. Most of Odyssey's moons aren't designed to feel like unique challenges. Most of them are deliberately designed to be gamey. They are deliberately designed in this minimalist way. The shrines in Breath of the Wild and the challenge recycling in Mario Odyssey are, at least in my humble opinion, by far the weakest parts of those games. Both games are absolute masterpieces, but those areas are lacking nonetheless. So here's the truth. I honestly never care too much about those flaws. Games are incredibly complex to develop and I used to believe that they simply didn't have the development resources to craft unique coatings for everything. You know, I used to think that Nintendo would have loved to give all the shrines a different theme, that they would have been really happy if they were able to frame all the different scarecrow challenges as different and exciting things and so on. I believed that they simply weren't able to do so because of evil, unfun, real-life restrictions. That's what I used to believe, but I do know more. Which finally brings us... So here's another one of those purpose maps, one of those thingies that only show us the elements that are relevant for gameplay. This time we're looking at Bowser's Fury. At first glance, this map looks similar to those maps from Galaxy. There is ground to jump, there is an ouching surface, there is a death area below us, and so on. At first glance, it looks similar to the maps from Galaxy. But that's an illusion, because this little purpose map holds a secret, because this silly little scribbling is able to tell us a lot about Nintendo's priorities when developing Bowser's Fury. Let's remove the map together and let's take a look. Did you notice it? There is basically no coating applied to the actual gameplay. The map that only shows gameplay relevant objects is almost identical to the actual game scene. And it is not just this island that looks like that. Every single island in Bowser's Fury is designed like that. All the areas in the game are unbelievably understated. The islands don't have this Hakuniwa-like quality anymore. They don't try to emulate mysterious places. They are just video game places in a video game without anything on top of them. When developing Bowser's Fury, the team was in a really unique situation. Tons of the parts of the game were already finished before they even started, since Fury is built on top of 3D World. You know, the enemies are already designed and animated. They have access to all sorts of assets, like a complete set of desert textures, everything required to build a ghost house, volcano tiles and whatnot, alongside the shaders, the particles and the weather effects needed to bring all those places to life. But the team didn't decide to code the islands similar to how Galaxy codes its planetoids. Take the island with the invisible floor as an example. This isn't a ghost tower or a destroyed desert ruin or any Thing. It is just an empty, neutral island without any theming whatsoever. They didn't frame this Kate Island as a frozen winter wonderland, instead they built it out of blue video game concrete. They didn't code Meow Mountain as a huge dangerous volcano, they built it to be a weird glowing block and they didn't frame the rotating obstacle island as as I don't know, maybe as rotating sweets and cookies over deadly soup. Instead they built it out of simple single color blocks. The team had access to all of 3D World's resources, yet they chose to go with extremely understated and simple environments. They basically designed the game along the same rules as Breath of the Wild designed its shrines or as Odyssey its challenge rooms. They are as simple as possible. And at least according to my little conspiracy theory, 
they did so in order to prevent the environments from interfering with the gameplay. At the beginning of the video, we waffled about how Nintendo probably always asks the question, how does this serve the gameplay, before adding anything to their games. And I believe it is this exact question that led to the shrines in Breath of the Wild being so soulless. It is this question that led to challenge rooms in Odyssey that only consist of single color blocks. And it is this question that led to them designing the different islands in Fury without any environmental coating. Because if we are serious for a second and ask ourselves the question, what the coating adds to the gameplay, then the surprising answer is, Nothing. It doesn't matter if we run on top of blue video game concrete or on top of a volcano. It doesn't make a difference for the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay experience. Blue video game concrete is actually superior to video game volcano. Because blue video game concrete is easier to recognize as a walkable surface than, let's say, cooling magma would be. But it is not just the environments that aren't coated in Bowser's Fury. It's the objectives as well. There is this one mission in the game that actually alienated me so much that it is Honestly, the whole reason this video even exists in the first place. It's this cat that lost her baby kitten. Poor cat, it is up to us to save mommy cat's day. And thus, we search for the kitten. We find the kitten. We grab the pussy like a president and then we carry the kitten back to mommy cat. We're rewarded with a cat shine and everyone lives happily ever after. Until the next island, where would you believe it? What a coincidence. There is another cat mom looking for another three lost kittens. And that's not even the final cat mom, because the next island also features a sad mommy cat. This one actually managed to lose all five of her children at once. Mommy cat of the year. And thus I found myself carrying a kitten back to its mommy for the ninth time in a single playthrough, thinking about whether the kitten mom lost the same kitten five times in a row or five extremely similar looking kittens. And this was the exact moment when I started to wonder, why the Wiggler didn't they code those objectives differently each time? You know, why didn't they replace one cat mom with a locked shrine that only opens up once we've found some keys? Why didn't they replace one cat with us searching for Captain Toad's lost backpack or with looking for Princess Peach's missing heirloom or with us retrieving Waluigi's lost smash invitation or whatever? We could even have all of those challenges be slightly different from each other. Maybe we can't run while carrying cats. Maybe we are on a timer once we pick up a key. Maybe Captain Toad's backpack is so heavy that we can't jump while we carry it. You know, why didn't they at least try to frame those objectives as something different every time? And it is not just finding the kittens that is repeated several times with no modification. Almost every objective is copied and pasted several times. We don't have to catch Shadow Luigi once, but several times. There isn't one, but many shines hidden beneath blocks that only Bowser is able to destroy. There isn't one Plessy coin challenge, but many. And what a lucky coincidence. There are even several Scarecrow-like challenges that spawn single color video game blocks into the world. It is the same as in Odyssey. Nintendo doesn't even try to frame the objectives as something different. They don't code their objectives anymore, the same way they don't code their environments. Which finally brings us to my little conspiracy theory. Because I believe the reason why the game is like that is because this is all that is left once we reduce the game down to only its moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. The thing is, at first glance, there is nothing to be gained by framing the objectives differently. The actual task is always to carry something from A to B. So we might as well always have it be cats, because then we only have to introduce the idea once and afterwards our silly player sees a cat and she knows find a cat. There is no immediate benefit by having several coatings for the same objective called chase something, or reach something in time, or swim towards several specific points fast, or be here while Bowser spits fire. You know, from a gameplay perspective, it makes total sense to establish each task once and then to repeat it over and over again. The same way, it makes total sense to reduce the environment down to be as unobtrusive as possible if we design a puzzle shrine. But, and this is a gigantic but, video games aren't only about the moment-to-moment -moment gameplay. Super Mario Galaxy is not only a beautiful game because the platforming is crisp and the levels are well designed. It is also a wonderful game because all the environments are realized in a beautiful way and evoke a feeling of mystery and wonder. Banjo and Kazooie is not only such a beloved classic because the challenges are fun to play through, but also simply because of how unique and creative each and every objective in the game is. But many of Nintendo's biggest recent titles neglect those aspects. In 
favor of clear, simple and easy to understand design, focused on providing the best experience at the moment. And you know, they succeed in what they set out to do. Odyssey's repeated challenges, Breath of the Wild shrines or Fury's understated islands all feel like a ton of fun to play through in the moment for a while, but they also start to become really stale and repetitive fast and they make the games feel, you know, they make the games feel a bit artificial. Just to be clear, I loved my time with Odyssey, I loved my time with Breath of the Wild and I loved my time with Bowser's Fury. All three are amazing games as far as I'm concerned, but something about those games always felt a bit off to me. It's, it's kind of weird to put that into words, but those games didn't feel, you know, fully flathered. They felt as if something was missing. For a long time, I really struggled to put my finger onto the exact problem. For a long time. Until very recently. But it was standing in front of those rotating blocks, in theory, that actually gave me an idea on what might be going on here. I believe Nintendo's games are slowly getting too video gamey. They start to feel like experiences that were produced in a lab to provide a quick hit of fun video game whenever we look for it. And you know, it works, kind of, but at the same time, their games lost a bit of their soul. They don't feel like lovingly crafted places filled with crazy varied challenges anymore. Instead, they feel a bit flat and artificial. I honestly hope that Nintendo starts to reverse this recent trend and that they start to put more resources into stuff like objective coating and environmental design again. Because, because you know, at least I really miss it to peek into those video game gardens that Nintendo used to grow. So here we have it, how Nintendo always puts gameplay first in their games to a point that every single object has to serve a gameplay purpose. How Galaxy's environments are designed to feel like mysterious miniature gardens, how Banjo and Kazooie goes out of its way to make similar gameplay tasks feel as entirely different and unique as possible, and how modern Nintendo is doing neither of those things anymore. Probably because of an overfocus onto a gameplay first mentality. I hope you enjoyed this little video. If you did, don't forget to leave me a thumbs up and maybe feel especially like learning more about swimming waste deposit fishes and want to hit the subscribe button as well. Hope that all of you have a wonderful day and to see you soon. Goodbye!